Studies. I'm joined remotely via Zoom by Alexandra Washkin, the Design and Communications Director of City Arts and Lectures. Thanks for being here, Ali. Thank you for having me. I, I would love to have you provide the audience just kind of a quick overview of what City Arts and Lectures is and how do you work with the arts and cultural community here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, so we are a season of live conversations on stage, typically. We do about maybe like 40 to 50 events in a year from September to June. So we run on a school season generally. And we host artists, writers, politicians, all kinds of speakers in culture. We always enlist a skilled interviewer to just kind of have an organic conversation with this person. Sometimes they come with a book or they come, you know, to speak about a certain subject, but we really try to just get, you know, the guests to be themselves and to be on stage in front of an audience. So we really try to book a diverse group of people that will bring in different audiences and different sizes, all different, you know, demographics of people. And what is the typical season at City Arts and Lectures? I mean, how many uh, events do you usually have? And then you also have uh, various categories like science or you do yeah. a whole project yeah. with uh, 826 Valencia Street. Yeah, we do. Typically, we've kind of announced programs in groups of around six to 10, and they're often grouped by series. And two series actually run in the fall, one that's kind of nebulous and changes depending on, you know, who we want to host that fall. But the second one does benefit 826 Valencia for college scholarships. And Dave Eggers is really great in helping us, you know, secure guests that will appeal to our regular audience, but then also to a lot of students and teachers that come out for those, for those shows. And then in the spring, we do another two series. One that does change. Often it's cultural studies, which is kind of a generic term. But then we do a second one that's conversations on science. So we're, that's the only series that we do that's a little bit more thematic. We'll do programs about climate change and we'll kind of package them, you know, subject driven. And then the guest hopefully will have a draw of their own, but we try to package them so that the subject really draws people in. And that too brings a different audience. I mean, we have subscribers that just come to the science series and wait for it every year and get really excited. And so with the meltdown, if you will, of COVID-19 and its impact on live events, such as city arts and lectures, how has COVID-19 impacted city arts and lectures? And then how have you and, and Kate and Holly and the team kind of pivoted to try to address that? Yeah. I mean, obviously everything changed. I mean, we were in the middle of, or maybe just like a couple weeks into our spring series and obviously we couldn't convene no matter the size of the audience um the theater closed we could no longer i mean our guests are flown in from all over the world that could not happen even if they could it was like people weren't comfortable as it was kind of unfolding you know we were having to decide what exactly are we going to do with all the different guests and events. We had an empty theater. We ran into technical challenges. I mean, we have just kind of by nature been a bit of an old school organization for a long time. We've been around since 1980 and we've done things in a very simplified old school manner in a way. So we ran into technical challenges. I mean, all the things that everybody was really trying to figure out at the same time. It's Zoom and microphones and getting your sound and you know, if we are going to have the guest, can they hear us? Can they see us? How do we do audience questions? Like just running into all these new challenges. And thankfully, we're a small staff, which we are so grateful to be. And we're all very resourceful. We all kind of just found different ways to step in and figure out what to do. We did have to basically, I mean, almost hire a new person to handle the technical aspects. Those were skills that we definitely didn't have, but we have a fantastic person who has helped us do all kinds of technical things over the years, who just happened to also have these other adaptable skills to the 2020 meltdown. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's always been really important for us to pay artists and writers. And so we've really tried to maintain that through all this. 
some events had to be postponed. Some of them, we just kind of had to change the formatting of them a little bit. But once we got everything switched, that we could at least do, um, switched on to a digital format. I mean, for a while we were pre-recording the events and then just airing them live because of the technical challenges of it. Now we are back to live. That was always a really important thing, you know, the live organic audience engagement and, you know, keeping a ticketed model to allow us to pay the artists and the writers who are coming. And so now that we've done that, we finished the spring season, the events that we had announced prior, and now we're entering the new fall season where everything is being, you know, booked and programmed online first, not with the intention of being in the theater and that being taken away. So, you know, we're going with the flow a little bit. I mean, people are definitely getting used to it now, doing all this and tuning into an event online. I mean, we've always, we are a nonprofit, so we had a membership program kind of built into our donation model. And that we just, I mean, there was no point in even pushing those because we didn't know how long this was going to go. So for the first time, we actually did a somewhat general ask for our annual membership, which was incredible. I mean, people really came out and supported us and even just sent us really sweet notes. And, you know, we had donors who had been in our membership or on our mailing list for decades and never even donated before and even just sent us a small check and a nice note. And I mean, I even just brought it to our meeting here so I could show you. We tried to think of like, what would people really like and appreciate to have right now? And being in the theater, you know, what did we provide? It wasn't just the hearing the speakers on stage, but it was meeting your friends and meeting in the lobby with the person you haven't seen in a long time and talking about what you like to listen to and watch. And, um, you know, everybody's isolated at home. So we thought, well, why don't we get the artists that we you know, know and love and get them to design postcards for us. And so we had um, four different artists make us some cool drawings and we made them into postcards. And so we folded these up and stuck these into an envelope um, with a note just explaining, you know, you guys know what's going on. We're going to do what we can. And that for us was just kind of reminded us that there was an audience out there. I mean, being just on the computer the whole time and not seeing all those faces listening to the guests was such a weird transition, but reaching out and, you know, just saying, Hey, we need your support right now. People were really responsive, which was, which was great. I mean, right now we're just kind of keeping with the digital model because obviously large events are going to be the last thing to come back amidst all this further out. I think we're probably, trying to think of some creative ways to get people to be able to convene, whether it's events outside or small events, what kind of more intimate things can we do as they become safe. But for now, we're just going with the flow and doing online ticketed events. And we have a bunch of events listed on our website. We're adding more every week. So, yeah. So people can support City Arts and Lectures by purchasing vir uh, tickets to virtual events, becoming, yeah. becoming members. Um, exactly. Yeah. And it's also been always important to us to offer tickets to teachers and students for discount or for free, which we are very grateful to be able to keep doing this fall. And yeah, I mean, make a donation, buy a ticket and our website. I mean, I don't know that I mentioned this before, but we even ran into challenges with our website being formatted to sell live events. It was just, we had to make a lot of different shifts. And so now we've kind of got the website to show you different things and to make it easier to donate if you want to, but then also to be able to browse our archive. The programs that happened in the spring, you can now watch for free. And then even some of the events that are happening live after a couple of weeks, they will also become free. So yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot to check out. And so what would you say over the last 40 years, City Arts and Lectures' biggest impact has been on the, the arts and cultural community in San Francisco? Hmm. You know, I think it's always been, from what I understand, City Arts was one of the early organizations to really promote, like I said, that organic conversation with a public figure. And so 
I think we've been able to maintain that and people really rely on city arts as a place to find out, you know, what to read or what to listen to or what's on the pulse right now. And I think I said it before too, by creating that space, I think we then made another space where it was a place for people to convene and, you know, running the, our own theater made that much easier to do. And we are just able to help people stay in touch and stay entertained and stay informed and give a platform to artists and writers who might not have one otherwise or ones that have one, but just love to come to San Francisco and be a voice to the public. And then final question, what would you say has been or could be from your perspective, uh, good outcomes coming from the COVID-19 pandemic and its mm. impact not only in city arts and lectures, but our arts and cultural community at large, or just our community at large? Yeah, one thing that we've noticed for sure is that by hosting events online, I mean, I don't know if I mentioned that we're also on KQED here in the Bay Area, but then also 50 stations across the country. And all of those listeners that we had from the radio who were in, you know, Nebraska or New Jersey, they could actually never come to an event in person. And though they still can't, now that we're doing events online, I think we're actually reaching a much broader audience than we ever have before. And I think that's probably true of a lot of arts events. There's the access hurdles. Some of them have really, you know, been overcome through these amazing technological advances. And I think in addition, something we found to be really cool is that a couple of years ago, we did an event where part of the conversation was a coffee demo. And it was about a book about a coffee farmer. And after the conversation on stage, we had a little coffee prep pouring demonstration. It was super cool. And we'd never done anything like that. And we had so many people who were like, that was so cool. Like that was my favorite event of the year. Like, wow. Oh, cool. Okay. And so it's kind of loosening the boundaries, I think, of what an arts organization can do and offer. There's just a lot of creativity to be found within all of these new weird restrictions of the world. Thank you, Ellie, for sharing City Arts and Lectures' work today. Uh, we're going to make sure that everybody who's listening and watching this uh, interview uh, will have all that stuff on our website. Please stay safe. Give my best to the whole City Arts and Lectures crew. Hopefully, on the other side of this, we'll have an even more interesting arts and cultural experience at uh, the Sydney Goldstein Theater. Definitely. Thank you so much, George. <laughs>